<laughs> All right, cheerio. Cheers, mate. They won't give me a passport. So <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, what we the plan is to have a quick chat uh, about topics, but that you would see in this tournament, right? So a little bit prep, discussing Malaysia from a debater's perspective. For those of you going to this tournament, this there's no time like the present to find out about Malaysia. Um, there's going to be loads of debates at this tournament about Malaysia. I'm, I'm, I think every other round, you're going to get a, a Malaysian topic, you know, pretty much. Plus, the room's going to be full of Malaysian school kids and teachers. Uh, and you, you want to be able to you know, empathize with them, get them on your side, put pressure on that adjudication panel in front of you to give them the vote. So what we're going to do is run through some of these issues here with, with Prabha. Uh, I'm, I'm going to let hope Prabha you know, to take the lead in here, a lot of these discussions because, you know, A is older than me. Uh, <laughs> and that's a, that's a very important part of, of, of Malaysian way and culture. Uh, also had more time to spend in Malaysia by definition of being older than me. Uh, Prabha also writes for a newspaper. Prabha has been involved with, uh, you know, advising, let's say, a political party working with. Yeah, I won't tell which party. Uh, yeah. We're not in power. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, so we, we hope to cover, of course, the all-important affirmative action issue. Uh, we're going to look at the financial aspects, talk about one Malaysia development, Berhad, uh, a large company, sovereign wealth fund established by the Prime Minister, uh, GST, uh, and talk about politics. And there's a lot of things to cover, and we hope to cover it quite quickly. So what's, what you're going to get is mostly, um, well, not superficial, but not that much depth either, right? So we're going to touch on some of these issues. You, you may have to do some reading after this, but you, we hope by the end of this, you're going to get a, a view unlike no other. Um, and uh, yeah, that part we can guarantee. Definitely. Like no other. Like no other. And some ideas about what to run on some of those topics, okay? So we're going to start with a, with, with a quick overview of, of Malaysia, the, the Malaysian story. And I think this maybe will be important uh, when you talk about, say, social climate, you try to predict a trend that people understand the psyche of the, the people, but also the political parties, right, uh, in Malaysia. So tell us a little bit about the formation of Malaysia, Prabhu. Oh, I'll be very happy to do that, Logan. Um, a lot of people have been talking about Malaysia in the past year, obviously because of the airline incidences. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a little bit more to Malaysia. We're trying to keep it to the bare minimum. First of all, Malaysia is a federation formed from British colonies, north of Dutch Indonesia and south of uh, French Indochina, Thailand, and also the Philippines on the Eastern Corridor. So we have two parts to Malaysia. One part is connected to uh, continental Asia and the other is in the largest island in the world and that is Borneo. So these two components fall together, although they are divided by the largest sea in the world, the South China Sea, because they all were part of the British colonies in that part of the world. And they were brought together, obviously, with that encouragement of a common British heritage. It has been having the same government for 60 years. Uh, most of the leaders come from, uh, what do you call? Uh, no nobility and also royal bloodlines. Even though it's a constitutional monarchy, uh, a fair number of politicians have links, whether by bloodline or by uh, long-term relationships with the monarchy. And one thing interesting about the Malaysian monarchy system where you really can't, you don't have such a monarchy elsewhere is that it's a monarchy with monarchies within it. It's a little bit like the UAE, uh, UAE. Yeah. Um, nine monarchies, and each one of them takes turn uh, every five years to become the king or what we call the agong for Malaysia. So there are constitutional heads for each of the states, the nine states out of the fourteen, and there is an agong. But they, they don't really have that much of an influence in political power, do they? Actually, that is one of the debates that you mm -hmm. might have. Uh, 
and people might draw some references to Thailand's own uh, monarchy, uh -huh. uh, but as I've already outlined, uh, these clear uh, distinction. The issue in Malaysia would be that all nine uh, monarchies or the states have their own constitution, state constitution, and that has not been altered from a British occupation period. So there are some uh, certain peccadillos for each of the states, and that gives uh, free reign to some of the sultans of those states, and it becomes a contentious issue. And right now there are contentious issues in at least three different states over the powers of that of that monarch. Mm -hmm. And these refer to, so a lot of them are ceremonial, like they approve the chief minister, the chief of the state to, who gets uh, well elected by the, the people and so on and so forth. But it's come to prominence because they most of these monarchies were put in power or gained power and have a close relationship with the ruling government. And some have been hesitant to uh, certify, I'm not sure what the, what, the, what the phrase is, to approve of the leaders of certain states, like, like in Slangor recently? Yep, uh, that was a situation where the Sultan of Slangor, mm -hmm. the venue of the world's debate competition is in Slangor this mm -hmm. year. Uh, Slangor is the most prosperous state uh, in the federation and also uh, houses uh, the federal territories where the capital Kuala Lumpur is. Mm -hmm. um, the most populous have, state as well. Yep, correct. And that's where the issue builds from. Uh, where does the power start or end? Without getting into a, a lengthy discourse on uh, constitutional power and monarchs, what mm -hmm. is important is that there is a lot of uh, space for interpretation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and for the courts to play a role. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in Malaysia for years, the courts have been uh, the tools of the state. So therefore, they've been very quiet, very silent on many issues. And they also have not been consistent on those issues. That is why it's difficult to discern. And that's why it makes it an interesting uh, discussion point. How much power can a constitutional monarch hold? Okay, right. So that's that's an important part with the development of, of Malaysia to understand where we are now. Groups of different states, although uh, not not as federalist as some other like sort of federal countries. You know, it's not, nowhere near the United States of America, not Canada, not Australia. Very very much a strong federation. Right. Uh, it does because the we have had the same party. Governing, although we have had six prime ministers, they've all come from the same political party. In, in fact, the current prime minister, uh, Najib Raza, right now is the son of the second prime minister, uh, Raza. Mm -hmm. And more interestingly, uh, he has relations or relatives in his own cabinet where uh, second or third in line, third or fourth in line is his cousin. Hishamuddin Hussein. Uh, indeed, indeed, the first prime minister uh, was the uncle of the first Agong for the country. So there are these close relations uh, between all these leaders. Before we get into talking about the opposition, uh, it's important to understand the, the spectrum of uh, political evolution in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. Throughout the British uh, occupation or rule, the ethnic groups were very polarized. You've had um, a large Malay Muslim population in the fringes and especially in uh, rural areas. And you've had a small Chinese population and in some parts of the cities, a large Chinese population uh, together with um, smaller Indian population that came mostly out of British India as laborers and some also as civil servants. Throughout the British rule, uh, there was a divide and rule attitude towards these uh, communities. Mm -hmm. And right after the Second World War, when nations were slowly getting free of the yoke of uh, colonial powers, the British 
uh, formed an, uh, formed a, a, a unique solution for Malaysia in the sense that power sharing between the communities. And that dovetailed to the fact that though you have a Malay only party, UMNO, that's governed for 60 years, from the start, it shared power with several uh, uh, ethnic parties, Chinese ethnic party, uh -huh. Indian ethnic party. At the initial uh, first six years where there was only Malaya in Malaysia. After that, when you had the Borneo state, Sabah and Sarawak joining in, uh -huh. other ethnic organizations or parties from Sabah and Sarawak, which is in Borneo, uh -huh. also joined the general coalition. So the people who've been running Malaysia all this while have very much been tuned in to ethnic representation, though there are one or two minority parties in the larger 14-party coalition that's Barisan National, that's mm -hmm. headed by AMNO running the country today. It's important to understand that because many issues are discussed in a way that they are divvied up or articulated from the lenses, from the lens of racial politics. Mm -hmm. There was a time when AMNO considered opening itself up to other uh, races. One day that caused split within Amno. Uh, it did, but it was uh, premature before independence by the working government that the British were readying to run the country. There was that one time that experiment, and it failed because it felt that the party, uh, that the nation, could not have a uh, non-race-based political party. There could be cooperation but there cannot be a single identity through the auspices of a political party. Didn't like Hussein on or someone say like we should, Amno should open up and let more people come in, or other races? Well, that's the one I uh, was drawing to, not Hussein on, it's uh, his father, On Jaffa. On Jaffa. Uh, I get the, the ons mixed up all the time. The father, the founder of Amno. Right. Um, he asked for the inclusion of non Malays into AMNO, mm -hmm. and when that party leadership, Supreme Council, said no to it, mm -hmm. he left the party. And that led to Tunku Abdul Rahman to assume the presidency of the party, and thereafter the first to become the first prime minister of the country in 1957. See? So, I told you Prabhupada's older than I. I wasn't there in 1957. <laughs> what is interesting also is that because we've had the same party in power, in fact, the Malaysian government today, through its, all its evolution, is the longest standing government in a democracy. Uh, before that, it was Mexico for 71 years, but yeah, right. we had a change of government in the 90s. This Malaysian government is the uh, technically last man standing. Uh, this government was formed from a different time, not only from a different, different uh, century. So maybe that's an argument you could use you know, to defend the government, the historical value of staying, not that's the most right. powerful argument, I guess. Well, it's a question of stability versus uh, change and also incumbency. Incumbency is always a big issue. Uh, the difficult thing to argue against that is Malaysia has always been a growing economy. It's yep. had a few periods in which it had some shortcomings, but yep. by far, it is an economically viable nation. Yep. And that leads me to that uh, final part of the uh, political discourse, and that is the opposition. Uh, there has been uh, changes, massive changes in the type of parties that have uh, opposed AMNO and its uh, coalition. Uh, those parties that oppose them, who also then form coalitions, have gone through uh, different kind of avatars and they've also fallen, obviously because they never assume power. Uh, parties that consistently stay out of power also then have uh, internal problems of their own. Uh, from the socialist, or, uh, pa socialist inclined political parties from the mm -hmm. in the 1960s, um, to the very communal parties of the 70s and 80s, there would be the Democratic Action Party, DAP, oh. which is largely supported by, um, by the Chinese community, uh, traditionally, and PAS, 
which is actually the Islamic Party, and that's of, uh, supported by a large uh, truncheon of Malays, who are also internally Muslims, and that support base has grown uh, substantially over the years as Islamization also grows in the country. And the last person to join the uh, join the jamboree has been Party Kaadilan Rakyat, mm -hmm. which is actually a party born out of um, dissenters within mm -hmm. UMNO in the late 1990s when then Deputy Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim mm -hmm. was sacked from his position and his, his uh, demise from the party and thereafter um, imprisonment, imprisonment yep. uh, led to the formation of the party led by his wife and also uh, his daughter playing a key role along with many uh, of the, those who left Amno. Mm -hmm. So people who were close to him largely, although uh, some of that has changed since, um, but there is still uh, a large influence, the, his shadow looms over the party, you say? Um, always going to, uh, Anwar is always going to be crucial to the party. Oh. However, what's important is uh, PKR isn't a race-specific party, mm -hmm. and at the same time, it had many people from the ruling party or ex-members of that part, of that group. So it, yep. it it created a schism in the country. It provided a party that was had a background government, and at the same time had people from all uh, cross sections. So now you have uh, the kind of party that Amno threatened to be mm -hmm. when On Jaffa left that party in 1951. Yeah. So, so that's, that's, that's why PKR is uh, symbolic in that sense. However, uh, PKR has never translated its, uh, its symbol mm -hmm. into a massive win in uh, general elections, even though in the last two generations of 2008 and 2013, there have been unprecedented gains made by uh, the coalition uh, formed by PKR with DAP and PAS. And that's the current opposition you have in Malaysia. And you will not have a general election uh, any sooner than 2017 in Malaysia. Okay. I think that's a, that's a pretty good overview. We covered, we covered everything. I'm wondering if we need to talk about like what happened in 2008, like why things changed, uh, where are things now? Do we, do we need to, to get into that? If we want to talk about no. political change. Tough, man. Tough? Okay. Yeah. I'm still recording this, this part. I like the fact that you're recording this part because they have to understand that uh, so much we can be saying uh, from <laughs> 2008. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna edit this out. Okay, I'm just gonna. Put to, it 2013. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Things to but, look into. Yeah, but what's the the greatest reala realization has been that uh, the Malaysian electorate isn't divided purely on race anymore. Yeah. Uh, there's a large generation uh, Y in the country. Uh, more than half of the country is below 30 years old, and that means in the next few years, there'll be more and more new voters. Malaysia only allows those who are 21 and above and yep. who are registered to vote. Yep. And there is no, uh, there is no what do you call it, uh, compulsory voting. Yep. And voting among that section is low, although there's high turnout for voters. In the last election, you had turnout uh, in the 85, 86% percentile, which is quite high. Yeah. in any country. Yeah, very high. And the registration process is very complicated. It takes like a month for you to register and sometimes people don't get registered and your voting areas may change and, and all of that. So it's a, it's a challenge. It's a challenge voting and yet a lot of people turned out to vote in the last well, elections. Well, Logan, the registering part is not difficult. It's when you do appear in the electoral role. Mm -hmm. So you could fill up the form quite easily and you can submit it to the election commission but where you end up as a voter is oh. always a mystery or if you do uh, there's always an issue of people who've registered but not on the list and people who haven't registered who are on the list so that's an ongoing discussion especially about free and fair election this relates yep. to a large organization called Bursay 
yep. who had protests since 2007, 2007 over uh, free elections. Uh, Berse is a single issue coalition of a non-government organization fighting for a fair and free election in Malaysia. And there have been up to four uh, mass gatherings which were handled quite ferociously by the Malaysian police uh, with uh, many standoffs uh, all across the city. In those years, uh, 2007, uh, 2009, 2010, and last one is in 2012. Yep. And then maybe we can start with that. I think that's going to be that. That was a big issue for a lot of Malaysians. Uh, I think Malaysians were divided about whether or not civil disobedience, public protests of this scale, was something useful. Was it was it the Malaysian way uh, of of resolving problems? Right. Uh, it, it it garnered a lot of interest. A lot of uh, it built a lot of awareness. Um, the protests were largely peaceful from the protesters' side, uh, although, yeah, well, they were, they, they were largely peaceful. Well, the largest outcome of these uh, protests has been there is an, an amazing amount of um, expression mm -hmm. from, blog, uh, from blogs to online news portals to Facebook pages of just individuals. People share so much more information uh -huh. since since the first birthday, uh -huh. which also coincided with the first uh, Indian rights uh, protest of Hindra. Yep, they were two weeks apart in two thousand seven. Uh, it's never really slowed down since then. So you could say that for the last seven years, Malaysia has been in a constant uh, constant uh, state of volatility when it comes to politics. Uh, about more rights, about who has the rights or not, and how much can you do through the uh, through, through the democratic means of polls, uh -huh. and how much can you do by having street protests. And this is the question you asked. Uh, yeah, some people have issues with that. They say you should allow for uh, organic change rather than uh, force, forcing the issue, even if those uh, means of forcing the issue that are democ democratic themselves. Yep. Uh we can we can get to that how the, the the theory of change in Malaysia and where that's going to come from, because mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a big uh, at least the biggest like paradigm differences I see with that is like these people who like you know you either need to get change from the outside you need to force change you need to change power you know force in, the change needs to be disruptive uh, or the change comes internally like there are liberal forces within Amno within Barisan National. Uh, and there's a gradual kind of change, and that change is stable. That change doesn't lead to uh, a, a revolution and people on the street and devaluing the stock market and exchange, right? And that's uh, that, uh, that's the change that that we can have uh, that is happening. Um, and to some extent, both these, these these theories can can lean off each other. But do we want to talk about each one of them? Uh, well. It's difficult to talk about any one without going through going into a a lengthy type of I wouldn't say diatribe but a, <laughs> a, a discourse uh. into it. Um, but there are always occasional uh, I wouldn't say whispers but exclamations from within mm -hmm. the uh, within the the government in power. Mm -hmm. But they are quite muted. Uh, they are quite restrained. So sometimes people just celebrate. Uh, the smallest of uh, acts of defiance. Uh, in fact, in the week past, we've had 25 uh, prominent ex-civil servants, uh, ex-judges, uh, retired ambassadors, ambassadors yep. uh, also senior civil servants like director generals mm -hmm. who run ministries, uh, coming out and saying that the level of Islamization, mm -hmm. mind you, all 25 of them are Muslims themselves, arguing the level of Islamization, the Sharia in the country, is worrying that it must be a subsidiary law to uh, the Silver general law available hmm. in the country, that Sharia shouldn't rise to become a law that uh, can uh, dictate terms beyond its, uh, its purview, which is restricted to family law. Um, and, and also, uh, what you may call it, wealth 
distribution, uh, you know, for wills. Yeah. That's pretty much what uh, Sharia was supposed to cover. But what is important is that in the last one week, I think all of you all listening to this should uh, quote it, 25 <laughs> prominent uh, civil servants. It's unprecedented, mm-hmm. hasn't mm-hmm. been done before. Mm-hmm. Um, although some might argue that these 25 also were quite in a position to make things change, do things differently, but they didn't do it themselves when yep. they were in those positions. Yeah. Uh, so that's a debate within that also. Yeah, but that, uh, so that plays into also this, this narrative of whether change can come from the inside or if change comes only when people are outside trying to force the people inside or whatever it is uh, to change, where assuming you want to have change and assuming change is going to come, how, how will it happen in the Malaysian context? <coughs> Um, if you're looking at elections, then you are looking at signs from the state elections that will happen in Sarawak. Mm-hmm. Sarawak is physically the largest state in the country, by a country mile, and it will have its state elections in 2016, mm-hmm. uh, the latest. I say this because all the other states have their state elections at the same time as a federal election for federal parliamentarians. Yeah. So this is the only election that happens separate and in those 72 states in, for, that, for the state of Sarawak, you could see yeah. signs of whether or not there'll be a change or not because Sarawak is largely a rural constituency. It is, as people say, Asia's best kept secret and also home to um, a lot of the oldest um, rainforests rainforest in the world and also natural <laughs> caves. So it is um, a jewel, but it is least industrialized, although there is a large uh, hydroelectric um, dam project that's almost completed over there. Uh, People are looking over there because of the 140-odd parliamentary seats that AMNO has out of the 222 seats available in parliament. Mm -hmm. Um, Srawa is the largest contributor in the sense that they contribute uh, 25 uh, seats. So they almost contribute one um, fourth or yeah. one fifth of the total seats that Amno uh, has now. Barisa National has yeah. in power. And when you couple it together with Sabah, which is right next to it, the two states in Borneo, Sabah gives out another 22 uh, parliamentary seats. So together, they shape um, not quite half, but large. So you have two states that almost make the majority uh, for Barisan National, uh-huh. when they only come from two out of the 14 states in the in the federation. They're... Sorry, so that's why, that's why the election in Sarawak is so important to see whether there are changes, there are yeah. discernible changes in the country or not. It is not about whether the opposition will win or not, but whether it can make gains. Yeah. There have been some talk about you know, Sabah, Sarawak uh, getting independence, separating from the federation, but I think that's unlikely to happen in reality, right? It's just probably trying to get more say, trying to get more leverage for them discussing, bringing up that issue. But although people in Amno are taking it seriously. Maybe, maybe, but while we are speaking about this academically and not having our personal views, uh, yeah. Sabah and Sarawak is separated from the federal government by the, as I said earlier, by the largest sea in the world. Yep. It's a two hour flight between the two points. So if to ask, is it reasonable? Uh, it's always going to be a valid geopolitical debate because those two components are also adjacent to other ASEAN countries like Indonesia and the, the Philippines. Philippines. Yep. So a discussion while academic at this point is quite real uh, yep. for those who debate geopolitics. Yeah. They also have some privileges with you know their own immigration procedures uh, and, and things like that so I think I think if debaters are looking at this issue they could draw a simple parallelism to how 
uh, India was at uh, independence, where Pakistan was both East and West. Uh -huh. Of course, East Pakistan today is now Bangladesh. Uh -huh. So the same set, uh, set of difficulties that Pakistan used to have all the way till 1971 when it became two countries, uh, in some sense, although for, for almost half a century, are present in uh, Sabah and Sarawak versus uh, the Sumlanjung or what they call the peninsula interests. And of course, there's precedence with Singapore separating from the federation, and although a long time ago, but still in 1965. Uh, well, initially, uh, while Malaya got independent first, Sabah and Sarawak indi independently, together with uh, Singapore, were supposed to form the Federation of Malaysia, uh -huh. four equal partners forming a single federation. Uh, Sabah and Sarawak were enamored uh, by this move because Singapore was joining too. These are all the four components of the British uh, colonies out here in the east, in this section of okay. Asia. Um, one of the interesting things, and you should remind all the Singaporean debaters who show up <laughs> in this competition, is that uh, never in the history of a modern democracy, a modern nation, nation states, has a federation or a nation given up its most prosperous and richest component away. That's what Malaysia did in 1965. After two years of a federation, Malaysia asked Singapore to leave Malaysia. Uh, it's just unprecedented. Uh, and plus, Singapore is not only the richest part of Malaysia, it's one of the richest parts of the world today. So yeah. when you think about it even further, it sounds ridiculous. But that's how ridiculous Malaysian politics can be and at the same time fascinating. Fascinating. So anything can happen. Run that line. Anything. Yeah, it's, like, it's, it's anything is possible. It's like the PGA. Uh, <laughs> uh, not not quite as exciting as the PGA. No.